everybody. Thank you all very much for showing up on this exceedingly cold evening. Um, with, I think, suspect if anybody also encountered some of the problems I did, transport problems and all the rest of it. Um, so we're really grateful for everybody making the effort to be here. That's really good of you. And now we're in our Alibaba tent. We're <laughs> giving us a glass of wine in advance. I think that was an excellent idea. Um, I'm really, really delighted actually to invite Atoro to give this lecture. Um, I've known Atoro for probably longer than neither of us should share with everybody, but um, um, most of his academic career. Um, and he has, well, he, I think he's one of those people that will continue to make a massive contribution to maritime archaeology because he's just got a vision about not just the subject, but also the direction of travel of the subject. Um, you know, his experiences are quite broad. He spent some time working for UNESCO, well done. Um, and that obviously acquired a great knowledge base. He's also got a very practical head. You know, he's done a lot of field work and both in terms of things underwater on the coast and now more recently in the context of the Rising from the Depths project. Uh, which he, so this is um, a, well, he'll need to learn it too, <coughs> but essentially it's looking at a sort of current cultural heritage as well as past <coughs> cultural heritage. And this is obviously a subject that we believe is a very important thing that we should be focusing on because it's the thing that gives that value. And so Atoro is going to talk to us this evening um, about that breadth of work, particularly focusing on the fact of the risings from the Dex results, but also. The Honor Frost Foundation have supported him in a postdoc to sort of build on the results of the work that the Risings from the Depths project has, has, has done through the directorship of John Henderson, who regrettably can't be here this evening, and really focus on how we can draw value from that in application to the to, to the HMF region. So that's probably summarised the lecture. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lucy. I think everybody can hear me, or shall I use the microphone? Microphone. Oh, microphone. microphone? Okay. I will just grab it with my shaking hand. Okay. No. Better? This way? Yes. So thank you very much for that introduction, Lucy. Uh, Lucy was, in fact, one of my teachers a long time ago when I was in Southampton. Less than <laughs> it was yesterday, it seems, anyway. Well, thank you very much. I feel kind of flattered. I mean, it's the first annual lecture after the pandemic, and it's in person. And I feel completely honored to have been invited by the Honor Foundation, and uh, really, very really happy to be here today, to be able to share my reflections of, of uh, the, the short career that uh, I've been going through. And I, was, I was standing there welcoming people, and I was thinking, I mean, this is really, really nice. I feel like in a wedding. I mean, seeing people, <laughs> you know, people taking a train to come and, and, and see me, actually. So it feels like more precious now to do these events in, in person. Than before, we were doing Zoom and probably being in the kitchen cooking and listening. Like last year, when I listened to the annual lecture for the 10th anniversary of the foundation, yeah, I was in the kitchen cooking. Uh, but it was, it was. So thank you very much to all of you for coming. Uh, my presentation here today builds up on different reflections uh, of my career working either when I was working in the National Museum of Spain of Underwater Archaeology, during the years I was in UNESCO trying to understand that diplomatic language that, that, that the organization was trying to implement and after also with the Honor Force Foundation. And I should start maybe by telling a bit when I started the career, when I wanted to join my two passions, which were archaeology and history, and, and, and the sea. You know, at that time, when I was starting my studies in, in the university in Spain, I started uh, looking into how can I mix that. You know, and the only two books that I had at the library at the University of Potence, but it were once by George Bass, and that book that was commissioned by UNESCO to Warner Frost and Angela Krum, and the water archaeology and NASA this. At that time, with an English-Spanish dictionary in my hand, a physical one, and you didn't have internet at that time, so you can already figure out when was that, I was looking into all the pages and seeing all the different cases that existed 
in, in at that time in the 70s in the planet. And I got three different quotes from the forewords of the of the editors, no? especially talking about the need to create cooperation and take action at national level, international scale, in order to make underwater archaeology something precious and something established at that time. The need for proper training and the need as well for legal and administrative provisions for, for protecting underwater cultural heritage. So we are looking here into international cooperation, training and policies. And through all my career, I mean, these three lines are the lines that the different organizations I've been working for have been focusing on specifically. And it's more relevant today, as we have seen in the work of the Armstrong Foundation. Uh, these are one of the main lines of actions, as we will see, and how they are contributing. Uh, how important it is that joining of strategic uh, partnerships with capacities at different levels, with policies also at different levels. Last year, we saw the 10th anniversary of the Honor Force Foundation. And this year, in the, in, in the conference under the Mediterranean, and I saw many of you in that conference, we really got a stock of all the different achievements that the Foundation has got into the, those 10 years. It was amazing to see how many discoveries, how many knowledge has been created in the Eastern Mediterranean, how many different opportunities that didn't exist before in terms of training have been consolidating the discipline of archaeology, and how all the works in terms of management approaches and policies, as well as publications and disseminations, are changing, transforming the face of maritime archaeology, especially in the Eastern Mediterranean. When I started working in UNESCO in 2011, was the year that the foundation was established, the Eastern Mediterranean had so many different challenges, but those challenges were already uh, showing the lack of capacities, the lack of consolidated teams, the lack of inventories in countries, and we have seen during all these 10 years how this has changed. So I will be focusing during my presentation a bit on these four aims as well, you know, which are the four, four aims that uh, the different international aids and foundations have been uh, focusing on specifically on that. But last year we saw as well the 20th anniversary of another thing that is very precious to me because I've been involved as Lucy said, the 2001 convention. This convention, which is an international agreement to protect and reward cultural heritage, was already debated in the 70s when that book by Young Force was already written the debate for the need to international legislations. It came into you know, realization right at the end of the century, in 2000, 2001, when it was adopted. And I had the chance to work for that organization during some years, uh, specifically giving assistance to different countries, in capacity building, in training, and, uh, and establishing partnerships. You can imagine, when I started in UNESCO in 2011, he was the only underwater archaeologist trying to face the reality of an international organization, trying to understand the diplomatic uh, language and a very heavy top-down approach with countries. At the beginning, it was a struggle. You know, I didn't understand why. I mean, science wasn't exactly the, what well, UNESCO should be doing. You know, UNESCO should be doing research. I was thinking. And then, with the time, I realized about the usefulness of of the organization, although. Is seen as a huge elephant that takes ages to move. It's true that when you know is well informed and scientists, organizations, society gives recommendations and approves things, you know, just by inserting some of those recommendations in a paper that eventually is approved by countries, things can move and change. But this really long period. So during the years in UNESCO, I saw the creation of a unity network of universities, you know, a network of universities in underwater archaeology, capacity building, etc., etc. at that time. But I also saw the limitations of having a specific program that was constrained by the same convention itself, the same text of the convention. It was extremely focused only on underwater cultural heritage. And the practice during that time was focusing specifically on shipwrecks on the need to protect shipwrecks. And that, as we will see through the presentations, had some implications as well in the way uh, people, specifically politicians and agendas, look into the preservation of heritage itself. There were other programs in UNESCO, like the Convention for Intangible Heritage, World Heritage Convention, all of them touched in one way or the other maritime archaeology. 
but they were in league between themselves. There weren't any synergies, and that was one of the main problems that I was seeing. So I was moving towards more but going back to academia and say, well, we need to create, we need to well, move away from that. At that time as well, there were the uh, negotiations about sustainable development. Sustainable development, we have a, a definition here, uh, like that, uh, on the screen, defined as the development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations. And it's an uh, um, agenda that has been approved by the United Nations in 2015, especially to face the challenges that we have on <laughs> the planet. You know, like, the, for instance, reduction of poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, gender equality, etc., etc., climate action, light bill of water. All of these 17 goals were the ones decided in 2015, like the main goals that we need to face in, in the planet. Obviously, you can see that cultural heritage is absent. It's one of the things that wasn't included. That has to do a lot uh, uh, because of the different diplomatic uh, and political agendas or focusing development specifically in economical terms. The history of inserting culture within sustainable development dates back to the 70s. You can see this quote by Director General Maria Zaragoza already at the end of the 80s. From now on, culture should be regarded as a direct source of inspiration for development. And in return, development should assign to culture a central role as a social regulator. He tried very hard to insert culture as one of their main goals in sustainable development. Uh, he didn't succeed, but not him and not the other director generals of UNESCO because of different political reasons. It's true, however, that in the current uh, 2030 agenda, we have some of the end, some of the uh, sustainable development goals that mention culture. The only one mentioned in cultural heritage is a, a, a sustainable development goal 11, sustainable cities and communities, and the target 11.4, strengthen efforts to protect and safeguard world's cultural and natural heritage. So here we are talking about heritage that is important for the world, you know, with a humanity globalized view of what heritage it is. So we are not looking to that many particular definition of heritage in local communities or, or local realities. We are looking into the bigger picture and we are looking into that link with sustainable cities. Then every sustainable development goal has a way of being measured, you know, to see if it's been achieved or not. And the indicator 11.4.1 is especially based on expenditure, on money, how much money is being spent for people. So we are seeing that always heritage is related uh, to economic expenditure, and that's difficult to value. That's all. that's difficult to value. I think. <coughs> I ran out of battery, so I'll um. try to put my my voice louder. In the recent. <coughs> this year. UNESCO and international community also organized a conference, specifically a summit, on the insertion of culture within the policies of sustainable development that was held in Mexico. For the first time, we read the statement of this, uh, uh, of this conference. You can see on the water cultural heritage being inserted for the first time, but it's linked first to the 2001 Convention and second to climate change. It's already an advance, but it's kind of mixed as well with the constraints of a specific international, uh, international <coughs> setup, like is the convention itself. UNESCO created as well a list of indicators so our community can measure that contribution of culture, cultural heritage, to sustainable development. You can see that on the UNESCO website, they are called the thematic indicators for culture in the 2030 agenda. They are talking about you know, different aspects and dimensions of sustainable development, like environment resilience, prosperity and livelihoods, knowledge and skills, inclusion and participation. The problem with indicators, they are based only on the data that the states want to give. They are based specifically on the reporting mechanisms that each one of the UNESCO conventions have. You know, the different conventions, tangible world heritage, they have a reporting mechanism. And the problem that we have is that the convention that is dealing with the water cultural heritage does not have a, a reporting mechanism. There is not a mechanism that evaluates how the convention is being implemented, how the, uh, the water cultural heritage by the states 
is being uh, dealt with, is being researched, and this is something that we need to work towards. To. UNESCO is moving towards trying to regenerate this and trying to organize a mechanism, but I think it's, it's also up to the different advocacy, the different network linked to underwater archaeology that we need to move forward and uh, invest also in that in that specific uh, endeavor. From the 2030 Agenda, and specifically to implement SDG, Sustainable Development Goal 14, uh, comes the declaration of the United Nations Decade on, of Ocean Science and Sustainable Development. We are in that decade in which, you know, we are going to focus the efforts of the international community, NGOs, <coughs> scientists, academia, and society in order to collect data from the ocean to see how can we get some of those aims, specifically the, those objectives that we can see in, in the right of the screen. Those are the outcomes that we are looking into the decade. We are looking for a clean ocean, a healthy and resilient ocean, a productive ocean, a predicted ocean, a safe ocean, an accessible ocean, an inspiring and engaging ocean. Cultural heritage at the beginning wasn't certainly included in the debates, but eventually the last <coughs> of the outcomes, an inspiring and engaging ocean, is talking specifically about society and people and the values that is being that, that the society are given to that ocean. You know, we can read it. That it aims this specific outcome to build a significantly broader understanding of the economic, social, and cultural values of the ocean by society and the plurality of roles that it plays to underpin health, well-being, and sustainable development. So we are looking here how the society is at the key of sustainable development. And it's according to that understanding of the different resources that is in the ocean, the knowledge of the ocean, of the environment, of the utilization of the ocean, but also of the culture that emerges from the ocean, that sustainable development will be achieved. This is something that is being particularly addressed by the Ocean Decade Heritage Network. This platform that was created in 2019, and we have the chair of that organization here with us, uh, is being supported by the Honor Trust Foundation and is specifically aiming at raising awareness of that ocean decade, especially to coordinate the community response to improve the integration of archaeology and cultural heritage management into marine science. So it's trying to put in together dialogue and communication between all those that are working in the ocean and science, and specifically inserting the cultural heritage approach within the wider marine science. So we have already an organization that is doing that specific work and creating a huge advocacy at international level. But furthermore, that organization managed to get also funding to get a program, the Cultural Heritage Framework Program, to be recognized as one of the 24, 26 actions endorsed by the decade specifically. The Cultural Heritage Framework Program is <laughs> the action arm um, of cultural heritage within the decade, trying to create an efficient interface between heritage and the decade, and ensuring as well how cultural heritage contributes to the sustainable development and to the decade as well. This framework that is just starting now, it will help us as well to create indicators and to join together different uh, aspects of maritime archaeology and, and the science in, 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 in general uh, to you know, measure specifically how we contribute to sustainable development through all uh, the humanities and all the different data that we can collect through the oceans in a very interdisciplinary way. <coughs> Moving on and taking into account everything that we have seen through the very sustainable development, through all the things that we are talking about, how the UNESCO Convention is being implemented. In 2019, UNESCO decided to do an evaluation of the UNESCO 2001 Convention. And it happens through all that study that several issues were raised, were, were raised specifically in order to enhance the, the effectiveness of the Convention. The Convention, during all these years, now it has 72 state parties, is one of the conventions with lower rates of uh, ratification and more problems with implementation at country level. And that is because different reasons. Some of the recommendations that we saw in that evaluation specifically was the need to have a long-term strategy. The convention is lacking that strategy, but it's lacking as well a long-term framework 
uh, so we can, you know, our source framework that we can aim at in order to have uh, a specific results. It was also evident that the discourse of the convention was particularly focused on submerged heritage shipwrecks that were mainly connected a lot with European expansion. So meaning that in the global south, uh, many of the countries within that uh, the colonization, the colonizing narratives, they weren't seeing you know, that heritage as something that they needed to protect. And I will show some examples later. They need to monitor and to create as well some framework you know, to, to, to see how the countries are implemented in terms of policies, but in terms of practice. My experience is that even if a lot of skills in maritime archaeology have been developed in different countries, it is quite unbalanced. The way maritime archaeology is done in some places is quite different to others, and the focus of research questions they, they differ clearly. Technology transfer, the access to data, there are many different issues that we need to also look into. And then also capacity building. We cannot just transfer the models we have for capacity building from one location to another without taking into consideration the geopolitical context. And that's something that we see very clear in the East Mediterranean, for instance, where we have quite a lot of different challenges, your political challenges, uh, you know, th that are needed to take into consideration when dealing with maritime archaeology. Just very briefly, I also participated in creating an evaluation of the different actions of UNESCO. This particular is about the capacity building and the trainings. During the period I was in UNESCO, it's true, and I was very happy to see how the people we trained in 2011 and 2012 in places like Africa or Latin America, they were the teachers and the facilitators of trainings later in 2017 and 18. So at least new generations are being trained and formed, and that's something that we have to, to applaud to, something that definitely is, is good. But then looking more specifically in the long run and the long impact of the convention and the trainings, we see how most of the trainings, they are short-term duration, they depend on frequent budget, so there is no guarantee that it's going to continue. There is also a lack of follow-up. You train people, but there is no follow-up from the countries on where are these people, where the skills are going. Maybe this is something that we can see a bit also in the Eastern Mediterranean with so many of the people that have been trained. We will need maybe to have more follow-up on the part maybe on the countries and the different institutions, and it's something that we can work on. Then the disconnection between the local socioeconomic challenges and the trainings, and the trainings weren't linked specifically to train on how maritime archaeology can benefit as well local realities and challenges. Just to mention some statistics, <coughs> when we see, for instance, this is specifically in the case of Africa, and it's very convenient talking here today in the, in the Oriental Club and, and seeing all these Oriental, uh, I mean, I see all the elephants around, <laughs> definitely, I mean, it's something that links to many of the activities that we've been doing in Africa as well. But when looking into the legislation, it's true that we have a big number of uh, legislations that include in one way or another underwater cultural heritage, mainly shipwrecks. With that same word, we see some legislations in Africa that they include shipwrecks in certain uh, periods of years. Then also there is a person responsible for the convention. But then we see the activities in UNESCO, for instance, you know, not maybe addressing the gender uh, equality goal that we would like to have. So yes, we train people, yes, I mean, we train others, but we are not looking into how to sort out some of the issues that we have with different groups in the society, like trying to have that balance between female and male representatives in maritime archaeology. This is a, a bigger issue that we can talk to. It's an issue that we have also in maritime archaeology in different countries, that gender uh, practice within maritime archaeology, that is also the, uh, something that all of us probably would like also to, do, to tackle more uh, in, 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 in practice and research. Right? But then all the, all the different schematics are telling us that even if there are many different activities at international level, we see how laws need to be harmonized to inside maritime cultural heritage. Impact assessments don't include marine cultural heritage even underwater when development is happening. And local communities, and I come always to the local community values because I think it's one of the main important drivers of sustainable development, they weren't even included. Just an example I was exposed to and I was taking part when I was in UNESCO too, it was the mission to Madagascar. I don't know if you recall at that time how in the news of the world this uh, person, uh, explorer, just a hunter, 
Barry Clifford came out of the waters of the small island of San Marie in northeastern Madagascar with an ingot that he said he was silver and handing it to the president of the Republic of Madagascar at that time. It appeared all over the news, it appeared even in, in the BBC news, uh, saying that it was the, the pirate captain's key uh, treasure, and immediately the uh, Ministry of Culture called UNESCO. They ratified the convention, so UNESCO sent a mission. That mission uh, proved that the ingot was in silver, was lead, and all the other different shipwrecks that they found, they weren't specifically what they, what Barry Clifford said that they were. So UNESCO proved in a very short mission uh, the lives of the treasure hunter. More importantly for me was the development of the actions that we had later. We developed a training, short-term training, depending on the funding, to young professionals there that are still some of them involved in uh, trying to get funding and trying to move underwater accurately forward. But what really is surprising at that time is the work that we did with also uh, Jonathan Schachmann and the African Center for Heritage Activities with the communities in some way. We went to the communities, we, different, we did different workshops with authorities, industry, NGOs, fishers, heritage professionals and the schools to see if the UNESCO actions had been part at that time, to see also the, the, the views they had on the musical heritage and the way they were valuing the whole thing. It was important to see that most of them, they saw the ocean as a protector and provider. It was the main uh, provider of the island itself. And it was important to see as well that the community had a traditional way of protecting different areas in the sea. Uh, sacred places, close, called the Fadi, which is a kind of taboos that the society had historically, in which those places uh, were specifically places that they wouldn't go to, they wouldn't talk about these places. If they were in the sea, there were places in which they wouldn't really fish there. You know, and that was very interesting because they were linked to people that died there, the ancestors themselves. Looking closer to those places, it was a kind of traditional way of preserving heritage. You know, because it was passing through generations and in those places you had normally underwater remains. But also talking to the new generation, some of them they were saying, well, you know, look, I mean we don't look for treasure, but if we look for if we find suddenly when we are doing our activities, it's a bonus, it's something else that we can sell, that we can provide. You know, some of the youngest generations, they are breaking those taboos because they are seeing that international uh, players are valorizing and valuing that in economical terms. So there is a problem with the dialogue there. And what was important is that they saw this as the history of the others, the shipwrecks that belong to the European expansion to slavery, they were the shipwrecks of the others. So there was a problem there in the communication. And it was interesting to see how when we talk about the treasure hunters, we talk about the national authorities, or we talk about what UNESCO had done there, they believe all of them came to the island to take the heritage from them. So they, they, there was a conflict there, and maybe one of the reasons why international policies weren't really having their effectiveness. And then an example was in the museum in that island, in which the only exhibition they had on maritime heritage, and it's an island that is completely maritime, was on the shipwreck the Serapis, which has some importance for the United States specifically because I think it was the first one uh, carrying the flag with the stars and the bars to the States. And well, the exhibition was financed by uh, a university in the United States and no one was there. There is no records of people from the island coming to visit them. So there is a completely mislink between the society and, and the exhibition itself. Whereas you know, those other uh, exhibitions that we had on the practices that they have in the island, they were receiving people from the island and visitors there. Also interesting, I wanted just to show you very quickly, you know, we also asked the students in the different schools to draw what was for them the importance of the sea, you know, of the heritage. And they all, you know, draw waves, because there's a place for waves around that they were providing. They all draw things related to pirates, because it's something that the tourism in the island is selling, but also at the same time shipwrecks. And coins, always coins. Whales, shipwrecks, and coins. And this is something, a narrative that is being created also by the actions of the international community, you know, and what they've been seeing. So it's an interesting way of seeing the value that people are giving to, to heritage. So just 
some of the findings of this first part of, of, of the work that was doing UNESCO was more on how heritage narratives change, you know, and they have to be plural and how to include it. So, you know, how people are important. Also, how politics are influencing the way we do the framework, you know, how we use that, you know, how, for instance, we want to, benefit, to protect for the benefit of humankind, but if we don't take into consideration the values and narratives that the local communities that are living with the heritage have, then we are missing, you know, the preservation is not really effective. Then also how, depending on the different actions, the practice, the heritage practice is shifting, it's mutating. People in different generations are changing the value towards, well, how can I use this for us? With the different economic problems they have, the different political challenges that they are facing. And then community situations, how maybe outside the westernized policy views, the westernized practice, there is other ways of practice, other customs that are protecting heritage of red. It's only a matter of translating it and joining them with the way we are doing things. So these four P's, people, <coughs> politics, practice, and policies, together with environment, is what is driving my research. You know, it's looking into this framework, how this framework is affecting and impacting the way we do training, the way we create knowledge, the way we do management, etc. So it's, it's, it's the part we are looking at. So with that in mind, now I'm talking more about moving more towards the work I'm doing currently as a postdoc in the University of Edinburgh, thanks to this agreement between the Rising from the Devs Network and the Onus Post Foundation, looking into Marine cultural heritage practices in Eastern Africa and the Eastern Mediterranean in order to create strategic vision, policy recommendations, to develop the discipline towards contributing more to sustainable development and to also create different interdisciplinary work through different partnerships. Pricing from the Depth Network is a project that was funded for four years until 2021. Due to the pandemic, many of the different projects had to extend the the, the, uh, the implementation until 2022. So we are receiving currently now different reports from the different projects and analyzing them. The principal investigation is Dr. John Henderson of the University of Edinburgh, and the focus is specifically to look into how marine cultural heritage can be utilized and can harness a, a sustainable social, economic, and cultural benefits, especially in local communities in East Africa is linked to everything I said before, to the 2030 Agenda and the Sustainable Development Goals, but at the same time to the Ocean Decade. It has financed 27 projects in, in Kenya, Tanzania, Mozambique, and Madagascar. I have to say that several of the people that got funding in Madagascar were being trained with UNESCO when I was there in that little training that we did. So there is some continuation of the people that are working in the area. And in the scoping phase, when and especially John Henderson and all the different uh, co-investigators went to the area, talked to the communities, with local experts, with uh, the local partners as well. They were talking about looking for that definition of heritage that is much more global. They saw that you know people were more interested in the different historical livelihoods and relations they had with the environment itself. Coming to that definition of marine cultural heritage that is incorporating not only tangible remains but also and tangible associations and current ways of living and interactions with the environment itself. Some projects, and I'm not going to go very, very deep into this, was for instance the, the Lapset project in Lamu, the creation of a specific uh, corridor and big port that was connecting Kenya to Ethiopia and South Sudan to uh, you know, transport gas, oil, and different type of uh, resources that was creating a specific port in the city of Lamu, which is a water heritage site, disrupting continually the historical relation of the local populations with the sea itself. Uh, it received quite a lot of uh, contestation by the community that saw that the traditional way of living, the traditional way of doing things, constructing boats, fishing techniques, was completely disrupted. And they needed to be displaced from the area where they were. That's showing that even if the place is a water heritage site, didn't include marine cultural heritage, neither tangible, not intangible, not underwater. So there was a problem between connections between uh, uh, the different conventions and also at national level in Kenya. Or the project more looking into the environment that was uh, facing uh, different gender inequalities, aggressive tourism in the area, uh, uh, and lack of uh, resources was the Mida Creek project in Kenya as well. This 
done by the local community together with national museums of Kenya, created specifically uh, local industries from the marine environments, are creating service together with the community in order to identify the different uh, marine cultural heritage assets, talking from underwater cultural heritage, but as well built heritage, and the different traditions that they wanted uh, also to preserve and show to the people, creating specifically NGOs and associations that were presenting that to local people, local tourists. It was clear and evidence that a lot of the uh, places that were presenting and which was very <coughs> as a touristic uh, attraction, they were focused only on international tourism and during the pandemic that was destroyed. It's showing specifically how tourism is a very vulnerable sector and needs to rely specifically with the people that are in the country and have international visibility as well. I wanted to focus a bit more on a project that we are continuing specifically more. You know, many of you are, and you know, you know a bit about the island of Mozambique, which is a small island in, in northeastern, in northwest eastern uh, Mozambique, that was very important historically and else as well a uh, related site. As we can see in that picture, all those little points are also shipwrecks connected to the different European expansion, Arab uh, colonialism also, and all different trade in the Indian Ocean. That work is done by the Center of Archaeology and Marine Resources of the University of Guadalupe Lane, which is uh, that they have a center in the island that is looking for the preservation of underwater cultural heritage. The map that you have on the left is the area that is protected by the World Heritage Site. The map dates to 2021, and you can see that only the area in red are the limitations and borders of what is protected, and the area in, in green is also protected but with a lesser uh, level. We see how all the sea is not included. That created also that in the 90s, uh, at, the beginning of the, at the end of the 90s and, and at the beginning of the 21st century, there was a huge treasure hunting activity provided by the government itself in this area. So the World Heritage Site was focusing specifically on built heritage without taking into account the marine parts of the island and at the same time that they were given permits to uh, exploit the uh, salvage many of the shipwrecks and historic. You can see here in Christie's, uh, in a, you know, that this is taken from a publication by Ricardo Duarte, uh, which is the archaeologist that we are working with that is there in the island. He's been fighting for years against the and now they have to stop it. Now is when they start to assess the damage that is done there. Within the rising from the depth project, together the Center of Eduardo Monlange University, together with Ulster University, they uh, implemented a project that looked into all the different ecosystems the around the island to see how marine heritage were contributing to the environment, to the community well-being and resilience, and economic sustainability. So it's looking into also the different sea level rise and projections into how this can affect the different economies and the different activities in the island itself was really interesting, but helped us as well as together with the University of Southampton, to, uh, Southampton to, uh, Edinburgh, to develop a project there as well, trying to put together all the different outcomes of Rising from the Depths into one particular project, looking into how those politics, how policies, practice, and people are affecting in one side. So the, the first scope of this project, which is uh, called Linking Nature and Culture to Support Sustainable Coastal Livelihoods, established in a marine protected area, which is coordinated by Dr. Georgia Holly here, is looking into identifying the different assets, uh, heritage assets that we have from the underwater heritage to the different biological assets that are around the world heritage site, together with different built heritage in order to guide the future, se uh, future seasons the, the creation of integrated management approaches and probably you know, the, the contributing to the creation of a marine protected area. For the time being, all the plans for marine protected areas, they stop right there in the north of this. They don't include the island. Uh, it, it's quite interesting, and even if they've been some, in, uh, some in aims before, some uh, objectives to create an MPA in that area, they never included the heritage for one reason or the other, so we are looking into having nature and culture in different assets and we in different silos and it's something that we need to uh, look forward to, to integrate together. This project we're looking into not only the results of the different exploitation of uh, the different shipwrecks but also to nautical traditions, trying to also in the future look into uh, ethnographic uh, uh, 
boat uh, reconstruction because there are many of the different boats that are disappearing in the development and also assessing uh, the different areas that we have on the water and on the land. Finally, rising from the depths, uh, you know, presented these results during the last year to policymakers, creating a specific workshops to debate uh, the different issues that we had with environment, with communities, and trying to insert as well, and it's something that we are doing forward in 2023, the different assets into the academic discipline, into training as well. These are some of the different uh, SDGs, uh, Sustainable Development Goals, that all the projects combined, uh, rising for this, have been contributed to. So, and this is just to show some of the main outcomes that we are looking at from rising from the depths. We have seen that how the issues of uh, how nature is being treated and how it's not the current environmental legislation doesn't include uh, heritage, and the same you know, current heritage legislation don't include nature. How communities are involved and the laws and policies they discourage that involvement of communities. How most of the laws that we have, and if this can be also translated into into the Mediterranean, how they only look into heritage as a, with a monumental view, they look into tangible heritage and not the links that exist with a tangible heritage, uh, how we need integrated management approaches linking nature and culture, traditional heritage systems were protecting, but this is something that hasn't been included into, into current policies. The problem with international conventions, we don't work together, they are implemented separately, but they are not even implemented. Or how research agendas and trainings, they are focused specifically a lot on the funding opportunities they have and what donors are requesting. So these are some of the different outcomes that we've been looking in, in rising from the depths, and that during my work, I'm taking now into analyzing the problems of the East of, of the Mediterranean. Now, coming to the Mediterranean, I don't know if you've been following the debates and results of COP27 during the last November, uh, but I think I mean it's interesting to see how the Mediterranean in this uh, in this event that took place in Shamish, specifically to deal with uh, climate change, the Mediterranean had for the first time their own voice. There was the Mediterranean Pavilion, and there were several organizations talking about how the Mediterranean is the ground zero for climate change. Being one of the most dense seas of the planet, with more than 480 million people living on the coast, and more than 500 million people coming as tourists in different seasons, creating a specific demographic pressure, not only on the different resources, but also in heritage, in the different city centers, etc. How that is creating an environmental imbalance. Other issues are, have, that have to do with uh, the tropicalization with waters that are warming faster, 20% faster than the rest of the world average. Water poverty, rising sea levels that is creating food uh, problems with food security. Just in the Nile River alone, you can see how the Mediterranean Sea is gaining a space and getting inside the delta, disrupting the whole ecosystem and the whole way of how people are living there. So the traditions, centuries and uh, these are the resources that they are having their scale and that is creating more tensions uh, in uh, and also the, uh, between the countries itself to look into how to <coughs> there is definitely a plan there is a Mediterranean strategy for sustainable development that looks into incrementing the 2030 agenda between 2016 and 2025 again cultural heritage is absent from that plan there are many other conventions in the Mediterranean, like the Barcelona Conventions, that they are trying to link nature and culture, but they are you know, not definitely implemented in the way we would like to. There are other anthropogenic activities that we have to look at. The Mediterranean is holding currently 25% of all the maritime traffic that passes through the, the, the plant. There are huge constructions of megaports for mega carriers, and we see plants in Alexandria, in Lebanon, in Greece, Turkey, Israel. It's interesting as well to see, for instance, the, the policy of China as well, because we say China is bidding for constructing these huge ports in different places. They are bidding to construct or reconstruct, let's say, the port of Beirut, but there is an important project for the Onsho Foundation going on this specific way as well. Lebanon as well, for instance, uh, announced uh, recently about their own plans for expansion of oil and gas extraction in the, the, in the area. This has to do as well with the different disputes of their jurisdiction between different countries, Turkey, Cyprus, Greece, Lebanon, Israel. And that creates quite interesting 
uh, way of looking into how heritage is protected, especially uh, beyond the waters of national jurisdiction. Since we have more technology and more activity going on in the high seas and in the seabed, there is more possibility to have data of all the shippers that we have in, 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 in the deep sea. Some estimations say that 80% of shipwrecks that haven't been discovered, they are in the deep sea. And that data is being collected first by all these companies and uh, countries. And we, Maritime Archaeologists, we don't get to get that data. And most of the sites could be destroyed in many of that. So that is very, very important to get into you know, collaboration with that, you know, create a transformation in the way we do things in terms of management, in terms of policies, in terms of economy as well. And that has to do as well with a lot of people. I just wanted to show, if I can. I don't know if you remember some 10 years back about the discovery that a Palestinian fisherman did in the coast of Gaza uh, of this statue, Greek statue, in the waters of the Mediterranean. He said he was in the waters, he was taken out of the water. Many archaeologists said that not because he doesn't have the, the different declaration that normally happens to uh, statues that have been underwater. Well, the thing is that according to the different, uh, different statements, this was given to the authorities, but it was found, you know, and it's an example maybe of the different problems that are happening, and maybe in, in, in gas Street specifically, they have to do with economic. Uh, problems, uh, the, the political problems as well, a lot of pressures, and maybe also the lack of valorizing this heritage. This was found in eBay uh, <coughs> that same year, and I remember in UNESCO looking at that and how we tie also to move into that. So it's, it's looking also how people are reporting to heritage as well. So this is one of the problems that we see in the East Mediterranean as well. And we can see it also in other places. Maybe I'm talking a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just exhausting the batteries. <laughs> so this is another of my interests. I mean, private concerns in the Eastern Mediterranean. I like seeing and investigating more about how people during years of conflict as well have been collecting souvenirs from the sea of they being inserted into the blood market as well. And this may be of interest to Peter. Uh, there are several garages in different places, this is specifically in Lebanon, where you can find quite a lot of Phoenician stuff that is being taken out of the sea, especially, I was told by the diver, in the period of the civil war. He invited me to see the collection, which is, as you can see, without any restoration and conservation in a garage, uh, and it has, and I can tell, more interesting stuff presented there than what you can see today in Beirut National Museum. And you have it in a, in a specific you know, uh, garage. Uh, and it hasn't been inventoriated, it hasn't been taken into consideration. He swore that he never sell this and that he was doing this for the heritage of the nation to protect it. Uh, he told me, well, in the years of the war, I sold some things to send my kids to, to the university. Well, that's something that we can research more. That contrasts a lot with another museum that uh, many of us know, probably Pepe Museum in Biblos, uh, in Lebanon as well, also you know, a, a collector, also displayed to the public, where Honor also gave some uh, of the different discoveries that she did in Biblos as well. It's interesting, in, as a curiosity, presenting different curiosities from different, uh, from Biblos as well, from Lebanon, but you can see here even some antiquities from Peru. I remember seeing that from other places. So he was a collector presenting different activities there. So we are lacking maybe that narrative of presenting heritage in the way maybe the community can get it. You know, they can see here, for instance, some of the importance that the sea has for Biblos. But I think it's lacking that involvement of the community on the narratives as well in the Eastern Mediterranean. And it's something I would like to continue maybe with other images from other museums as well around. But yeah, that's for a future project I would like to take. It's interesting since we are in Biblos, I mean, to talk about how important this site has been for the for, for honor uh, at the beginning, but also for the foundation. Since the foundation was established in 2011, uh, a project directed by Martin Francis Alouche and, and Nicola Riman is being continuing the, the, the excavations there and the research into all the different archaeology that happens in, in the site itself. Different problems with the management of the site put this into also the eyes of the World Heritage Committee that requested that the country should explore synergies between conventions. 
So at least we can see as well how, for instance, the international community and whether it is, is uh, pushing countries to look into how to work together between underwater heritage and tangible heritage and the World Heritage Convention, but leaves the country to look into the solutions. Into it, you know? And that has to do a lot with <coughs> decisions that we're taking, in decisions in the past. This is, for instance, you can see at the uh, mall that was created, I think 15 years ago, if I'm not mistaken, to create a, a, a marina in that area. Uh, during years of, uh, well, ill decisions, I mean, probably not taking into account the different advice from the heritage and the DGA, the Director General of Antiquities, they constructed that thinking of economic gain for the city itself without realizing that was stopping the dynamics of the sea there. That combined with the more frequency in storms created that, uh, you know, that in, an increase in coastal erosion that we can see specifically in that site. And you can see it when I was there in February this year, Martin was showing me how in the last 15 years, they lost more than two meters of the promontory where the site is because of the frequency in, in the storms, but at the same time, the, the different uh, decisions and, and anthropogenic uh, activities in that way. So we see sites that we cherish uh, that are in danger for all the different decisions. So we look how politics, but also policies and bad practice are infecting the way we do security. Another project in which uh, I've been not involved but I've been following very close since when I was teaching Alexandria, I took my students to this area, is the project that the Onsu Foundation is financing in the only fishing surviving community of Alexandria, traditional fishing community of Alexandria. This is the final plans for the development of a big port in the western Alexandria uh, Bay, in which we can see you know, that all the construction that is going to affect the traditional way of living in that area, specifically for mega carriers, as I was saying. That area, uh, you see here, we are talking about the Max area here, and that area is where you know, there's a traditional fishing community that is seeing affected the way of living, uh, and they are being also asked to be displaced. Well, you know, we see how the different area you know, is, is connected to different maritime uh, heritage remains, like different uh, archaeological remains, uh, different connections with the different between the sea and the lake in the interior and uh, you know, have both traditions, etc. The foundation, Rakuda Foundation, uh, together with uh, Siad Musi and other students from Alexandria University, have been working during the last year on the phase one of this project to document particularly all the different intangible traditions with the different built heritage as well, with both construction traditions and working with the community particularly to take stock of all the, you know, that heritage that is being affected. But they've been working as well with the authorities and with the poor authorities, and they are, uh, according to what they told me, managing to change some of the negotiations of the project as well in order to help uh, restoring and surviving and making survive part of this heritage. I know the project is going now through the last part of the phase one. We'll start a second phase next year in which they will work more towards creating awareness and skills in the community itself to create. Uh, well, to document, to, 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 to survey, and all that, to, to create also a space also for displaying that heritage to the, to the community and to the uh, future generations as well. Another project, different projects, no, that uh, looking also into the importance of policy here, are the projects that uh, we can see uh, trying to document that heritage that is not included within policy. That heritage that is especially shipwrecks that are less than 100 years old and that are eventually needed to protection and being affected by divers, by projects, uh, development projects, and because they are considered either within the 2001 convention or the national policies, they are just being affected and impacted. For example, it can be in Lebanon or in, in Egypt, both <coughs> ratify the UNESCO 2001 convention, and they have within the laws the convention applied and, and harmonized within their own laws, but they put the, la the, the limit of the 100 years old. So many shipwrecks of historical importance linked to the Civil War in Lebanon uh, or to the Second World War, for instance, in the Red Sea, they are protected. They are visited by thousands of divers uh, every day. Projects like the one financed by the uh, North Coast Foundation and uh, 
implemented by one of the foundations in Lebanon, Modern Shipwreck Project in Lebanon, or the Breast at Risk Project implemented in combination with the University of Edinburgh and Alexander University. They are looking into documenting, evaluating, uh, creating management tools, research, and looking into the impacts of tourism and creating public access. This is something that can create, and it's, 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 it's wonderful to see how people are getting involved into this and how they start understanding as well the importance of these areas for themselves, uh, and also as a tool for creating local uh, economic endeavors, especially in the part of tourism. Other project that is looking into creating, in, integrating people management, um, people nature and culture, is the recent project that is starting or has started now in October, November, uh, on Cyprus particularly to look into to develop a more informed and integrated model for the protection, research, management, and dissemination of marine cultural heritage in southern Cyprus. The idea of this project is to create a specific model that can be implemented in other areas of the Mediterranean. <coughs> specifically to look into all of these areas. So, I'm not, there are many other different projects. I just illustrated some that I think is particularly important to see the way in which the foundation is moving towards to, to be much more proactive than reactive, as uh, Lucy said last year in the annual lecture. I think it's moving towards creating that more strategic views to the future and trying to uh, challenge the current uh, problems that the, 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 that the region has. I couldn't finish without mentioning the work that the STEAM committee is doing, which uh, I am really, really thankful to, to be able to, to contribute to it. The STEAM committee of the Honorful Foundation is looking particularly into uh, policy and practice, seeing the different issues related to how the water cultural heritage is protected, research and practice, with a focus in the UK, but as well now shifting more to the Eastern Mediterranean. It's very important that the organization of the different policy forums that for, through the years they've been organizing uh, with advice of different experts, among them Anthony Feld as well. Uh, the different themes that happened in the last years were specifically on heritage, that they are international waters, how we protect it, the First World War shipwrecks and best practices, social and economic benefits of uh, underwater cultural heritage, and managing shipwrecks, different best practices for that. The next policy forum will be in April 2023, and it will look into some of the things that we've been talking today. How we create dialogue between the marine sectors and marine archaeology, how the archaeology, uh, archaeology and the people who are working in the marine sector, specifically energy sector and those who are working in, in the seas, can cooperate together to share data and to look for common benefits. I just wanted to to do, just show that it's been recently published this case book related to the policy forum in 2016 on social and economic benefits that is in the website of the Honor First Foundation has been announced on Twitter and other places and it's looking into different cases in which the Honor First Foundation has been involved in which it deals particularly with all the things that we're talking you know how marine cultural heritage you know is relevant to outcomes like community resilience ocean accessibility sustainable livelihoods shows the support of the foundation towards the decade of sustainable development goals and it also links culture and nature as, as one of the main focus of management that we have to look at and he also recognized the impact of human interaction with the sea of the millennia and how that helps us to understand the present condition of the environment so over the years we have seen how the foundation and this just is just a small diagram in percentages uh, and looking into the different projects of the foundation that has been mainly focused on research but how we are moving more towards seeing it, how it's adapting to the main challenges that the region is, is looking at like environment looking into management looking into policies and how it's looking more into creating more proactive uh, action you know, in, in that uh, looking into all that and looking into contributing to that challenges that we see in the region so. I'm getting to the end, but with this, you know, there's some considerations on how I see maritime archaeology moving forward. I see maritime archaeology obviously, I mean, it doesn't have to change. I think during the last years we have seen how important the technology, the different theoretical approaches to the disciplines have created huge advances in the way we understand uh, the maritime past. The conference that we, many of us, attended in Malta in the last month show all that, those, all, all those results of all those who are working in the Eastern Mediterranean and the Mediterranean as well, 
uh, how the discipline is advancing very strongly and is giving you know, important data that is very helpful to understand the past but also the present. What I'm suggesting and what we are seeing is that we just need to expand the scope of maritime archaeology to look into bigger issues as well, to all that framework where maritime archaeology is being developed in the present, all the different conditions that are creating the actions that we are doing. Interdisciplinarity is something that we need. We see it already in projects between science, but maybe we need to also go towards interdisciplinarity between different sectors, economic sectors, uh, NGOs, politicians, etc., in order to create a wider uh, effect in the way we deal with the past in the present. So it's also about creating you know, a humanities response to the ocean challenges, not only scientific response, but also that humanities and that focus on human rights changing you know, preservation of heritage to creating better well-being for the society through heritage preservation. We have to change that and to create, obviously, as I was saying, you know, to be able to have tools to monitor, to evaluate, and to adapt. And here I come to uh, 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 something that I read recently, but it's true. I mean, Tullio Scobazzi, who is an expert, legal expert in marine control heritage from Italy, already in 2001, when the 2001 convention was created, he was suggesting that the particularities of the Mediterranean requires a specific international agreement to get together uh, the different issues that we have in terms of economy, in terms of politics, in terms of um, energy, etc. Tullius Bazzi just published a new article now in 2022 that is recovering this idea that now, after seeing how conventions and policies have been implemented, we may need to open the debate to create a regional agreement. Seeing that most of the countries in the Mediterranean have ratified the Tuscan Convention, most of the countries ratified the Barcelona Convention on the environment, and know their agreements as well, it, it makes sense to combine all together on one agreement. And he thinks, I mean, this is it's an aspiration, it's, it's maybe utopical, seeing how everything works, but maybe it's something we have to aim at. And I'm going to finish with the same scheme as I did before. We've been working specifically aiming at creating research and knowledge opportunities, creating specific capacity building and education at different levels, looking into better ways of managing and creating policies, and also disseminating and creating outreach opportunities. Where my research is looking at, is particular, is the framework where these operate. So I'm looking mainly to the framework where I would like to develop more research in the future, which is looking more into the four Ps that I was saying before, of politics of the past, so looking into those national narratives and decisions that are taken specifically by political priorities that are looking into how we do research, how we uh, do capacity building, and where the priorities are. Global heritage, for instance, how the international globalizing effort to create heritage for humanity is affecting or not the way we do heritage as well. Also the practice, how we need to create interdisciplinarity, how to link different practices in nature and culture, how to create a much more participatory approach in which citizen science is part of the practice. Policies, how we join policies, you know, how we create a framework that is looking in an integral way to all the different assets that we understand in heritage. And most importantly, people, you know, how the local communities can have an agency role, an action role as well, when deciding and preserving heritage as well, and how the traditional practices can be combined with science and conventional science in order to create the best way of studying and preserving heritage as well. Usually, I mean, the, the green circle is the environment. What I wanted to somehow portray with this four piece is there where we, as, as archaeologists, as also society, can have a role of changing things. It's a place that if we study the framework, we can move forward. And with that, I finish the talk. And I thank you very much again, the Honorable Foundation, for having invited me. Uh, for me, it's been a joy. As I was saying at the beginning, I'm really happy to be in presence of many friends and uh, new friends as well uh, here with all of you and trying to debate on some of the reflections I've been having through the last years. Thanks goes as well to Rising for the Dead, to Lucy, to John Henderson, and to different organizations that are working. Thank you very much.